Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this morning, we're going to be speaking with Rachel Wolfson Smith about her solo show, Everything is Everything. Quick pan around the space. So these are all graphite pencil drawings on paper from these six by or six by sixes to this five and a half by nine and a half foot piece. Huge range of dimension. And I'm gonna invite the artist, Rachel Wolfson Smith to join us. Sorry for the maybe unsteadiness today. I'm on a bit of a peg leg returning from an injury. All graphite on paper. So Rachel draws on paper, but also uses a reductive process of erasing to get some of this effect. Definitely brave. Good morning, Hi. Rachel. Good morning, Kevin. How are morning. you? I'm good. Not quite morning for you because you're in Amsterdam, right? Yes. It's <laughs> a bit late for me. Yes. About 5 p.m. here. <laughs> 5 p.m. Well, welcome. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for hosting uh, a show that is very special for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so for everybody tuning in, I'm Kevin Ivester. I'm the owner of Ivester Contemporary, and this is Rachel Wolfson-Smith. Um, I guess, you know, I introduced uh, the title of the name Everything is Everything, but do you want to talk a little bit about the show and maybe talk about where that title came from? Uh, sure. Um, as with most of the work that I make, uh, it's difficult for me to separate uh, the process of how I got there from where I arrived. Um, so uh, just briefly, I'll say that um, these works started at the start of the pandemic. Um, I got pregnant at the same time, right when the pandemic started, and also decided to relocate to Amsterdam from a very happy home in Austin, Texas. And um, it was chaotic. It was a lot of identity shifts and changes and all sorts of things. Um, wonderful and difficult and um, really there were just were so many different things changing and so many different emotions that um, that term everything is everything um, kept coming back to me that um, you know my thoughts all seemed interconnected um, what I was researching the grasses the um, you know kind of emotional centers I was uh, exploring um i just kept finding connections through everything so uh everything and every everything is everything to me is just the interconnectedness of everything for lack of better words <laughs> and you mentioned the grasses just now the the majority of the show is about grasses where did that idea come from um you know, I've always been really tied to nature and to the landscape. I grew up on a farm, and even though I live in the city now, I'm outside a lot. I do a lot of walking. And when the pandemic started, I found myself walking in Austin. I was still there, and um, I noticed something really curious on my walks uh, through East Austin, that the, the lawns that were normally um, so beautifully well-kept uh, were suddenly overgrowing and all of the people were kind of stuck inside and what was going on outside was just kind of its natural state. Um, so I found that really curious and I, I thought it was so beautiful how you could see the movement of the grasses and I sort of went down this wormhole of doing research about uh, grass and I found um, 
you know, its origins, like the, the origin of lawns was in these power in these power gardens in the 1800s in France and Italy and England. And that uh, root sort of found its way to Texas, um, which is where we get this um, sort of classist thing um, where we have these beautiful lawns in our yard. Um, so I thought it was a real irony behind um, the wildness of it. And as I continued to research, I found um, a lot of differences in Western um, gender roles with the landscape, how men were, um, you know, in the 18, 1900s encouraged to go for walks in the woods and explore and find themselves and women were not encouraged to do so. They were kept in more, at least the upper class that I was reading about were kept in more private gardens, things that were acceptable for ladies. Um, but the na nature is really powerful. And I noticed that it found its way into patterns on china and on wallpaper and in dresses and you know in things that i'm still attracted to now so i found it really interesting how nature can be really performative for whatever need we have um and i loved thinking about it as natural but also decorative and that ultimately led me to use it for my needs at the time which were you know, so strange being moving and being in the pandemic and the baby and everything. Um, and I needed kind of a place to transition or a place of care. And so as the, the piece that you have up right now, these drawings of grass sort of ended up becoming rooms for these things to happen, um, you know, for me to figure out what I was thinking, what I needed, what chaos was going around me and how to um, find kind of this blissful calm in the midst of it. Hmm. And, and I think one of the most important circumstances of the show is the birth of your first child. This piece is one of the only pieces I've seen with figures in your work. Can you talk about how that sort of appeared and um, what that, what maybe what your drawing process is like and how these these images kind of reveal themselves to you? Yeah, um, it's a good point. And it was a, a surprising departure for me, uh, for sure. Um, I have purposefully not drawn the figure for a long time. I think it's so loaded with age and race and gender and just there's just so much baggage involved um, and since I use the landscape to kind of speak about things I've always been uh, uh, just avoidant of using the figure um, but I also am an artist who really tries to listen to myself and it kind of beckoned <laughs> and uh, this was strange because I, I could sort of see where this was going as I was building it. Um, it started about at the beginning of the pregnancy, so about nine months, nine or ten months before um, my son was born. And then I continued through the drawing, which finished about nine months after. So it's an 18 month period um, with his birth in the middle. And um, as I was building it, it was strange. It was like I was almost waiting for him to get big enough to use him as a model. <laughs> so uh, he eventually did get big enough and he found his way in there. Um, but through it, uh, you know, I'm listening to um, to stories, to, to books, audio books. I'm drawing. I'm, I'm finding this. Um, I guess I was finding myself in the repetition of all of these leaves which essentially are just these little patterns of negative and positive shapes uh, and when i can tap into like a really abstract process like that um, it's a place for me to focus and i can build on that from each day of work suddenly it becomes this huge thing um, yeah they, they do i mean these two in particular and, and some more than others read almost as just abstracts and mm -hmm. in the show do you understand that they're grasses and that there's this this thread um and what is it like 
finishing something like this? What is it like getting close? How does that feel? Because this piece is ma massive. This is a you know nearly six foot by ten foot drawing. Right. Um, it definitely feels like a loss, uh, especially I've oh. been creating this one in my home um, just for logistical purposes, and it was really strange because you, you work on it and you get to this sweet spot towards the end where everything's established and you can um, go in. Like I pretty much lay in everything and then I wait and step back and start to add in depth. So there's certain areas that will get really high contrast, other areas that I'll kick out with the eraser and kind of um, blur for lack of better words. You can see it in this one a lot. Uh, and I I can designate where I want the viewer's eye to go and kind of how I want them to navigate through the piece, what I'd like them to find. Um, and so that happens at the end and it's my favorite part. And then mm. boom, it's gone. So it's a, it's a bit heartbreaking and my wall feels very strange and empty uh, now that it's gone. It's like However, all the hard work has finally been done. It has, uh, <laughs> but I, I'm sure something else will go up uh, soon and I'll see where I am now. <laughs> and can you talk about this piece? This piece feels a bit, you know, different than the rest of the show to me um, because the individual leaves of grass are not um, in this. Instead, you've got some different types of plants there, the leaves, and it's just a bit more chaotic feeling. How, yeah. What was the process like on this one? Um, this one was, uh, this is a special drawing. This was a very slow one for me and um, was an introduction to the importance of the importance of movement, but also the connection between the body and nature um, for me, like a, just, just as, as a process, it's, it really um, connected the two. So this one is also from my walks in Austin. Um, there's like a baseball field uh, behind by the lake and it's just, there's like this bush. Um, and I was obsessed with it because it, it was, it were these vines that were covering something. And I love that nature given time will completely cover us over and all of our futile efforts of power and stress and all of the things that we worry ourselves over, um, you know, given a year will be completely covered up by brambles and things. And I think there's something so beautifully apocalyptic <laughs> about that and oddly, um, I don't know. It's like nature has its order. So I started on this drawing um, and it just was one of the, the drawings that um, I couldn't finish it quickly and it just needed something. And I, I held it back for a little while and then got this studio in Austin in the middle of like a 500 acre nature preserve. And it was that there were, you know, these winding roads that got there and I love driving anyway. So I, every day that I would go to the studio, I would experience this velocity of each curve and the arc of each curve and how fast could I go? How much could I break? And so there was this real cadence that started to happen. And when I went to the studio, those arcs from the road started to fall into the vines that were in the drawing. And it was like this dance of like, where can they be really um, punctuated with a lot of attention and where can they completely dissolve and still have the whole thing create this form. Um, and I love that uh, as the vines sort of dissolve into each other, I've titled it Babel, um, just thinking about how communication breakdowns and just things in life um, sometimes are really clear, other times they're just completely missing, at least for me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that that's a nice description of the thought process behind this piece. It's definitely the 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 tangled feeling of this piece. Um, and and lastly, I think there's these little 
colorful moments in some of your smaller works. And then the piece that's in the, in the corner that we were talking about before with the uh, eraser marks, mostly eraser marks, um, the pigment, where does that come from? What's your, what are your thoughts behind that? Um, this was, um, it's tied to everything else, but it was based on a little idea I had, again, by watching the landscape and watching the grasses, um, thinking about how these moments that happen are lost. And it's usually like when we take pictures of a vacation or something, it's like we take our picture of ourselves in front of a monument and we're facing the camera. Um, but what you remember from that vacation may be really different. Um, you know, maybe a beautiful moment, maybe a fight, I don't know. Uh, there, there just could be like a little punctuated moment that could be lost. And I thought about compressing all of these moments together into a single image. Um, and these grasses uh, were all after a flood had come, uh, like water had flooded this area. And so the grasses are starting to pop back up, but I thought about you know the trauma that the grasses went through to fall and be crushed and we'll forget those things. Um, so each color is kind of an imagined uh, moment, a punk, like a, a gesture or a moment, maybe someone looked at that spot, maybe they picked a piece of grass from there, maybe that p particular grass bent, um, whatever it is, I just thought about all of these layers of moments in time, kind of being like a heat map within this transitioning grass that's like gradually pulling itself back up. Nice. Well, the, the exhibition is beautiful. Thank uh, you. I wish I could see it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you could see it too, if you're in town, but um all the way over in amsterdam it's difficult to get here uh, a bit. but this work really does need to be seen in person i think um trying to do it justice with this camera and um video luckily the austin studio tour runs every weekend this month uh and this exhibition runs through, through december 4th so if you're watching this you want to spend more time on each one of these drawings they deserve to be. Um, I hope that you can come by and see Rachel's work in person. Um, Rachel, is there anything else that you'd like to add about this exhibition? Um, no, I, I think, uh, I think we've said good things about it. I just want to second what you say. And, um, I do think there's a real difference of seeing them in person versus seeing them online. Um, graphite is a really awesome material and it holds light in a really beautiful way. Um, and one of my favorite things about it is that it, you know, I'm describing light with it, but it also changes a bit in different lights. So, um, you know, in the morning it will look slightly different than high noon, than in artificial light, um, and different things will start to be revealed. So when you see them in person, um, you can just sort of experience the physical quality of this temporal, temporary material, this paper, this graphite, just these shapes of light and shadow. Yeah, and I'll add to that too. Uh, one of the things that I love about this work is even the small works behind me, um, with a camera, a lot of the detail can be lost, but when you're actually experiencing the work in person, they do read very differently up close and from a distance, but at every, at every distance, they're really impactful. Um, they catch yeah. your eye in the room, they, they hold a lot of weight. Um, so I have uh, really enjoyed installing the show, seeing the <laughs> show, walking around the show, and, uh, you know, you know, but our viewers don't know. You were the first artist that I that I contacted <laughs> about this gallery, and this is a bit of a full circle moment for me. I'm, it's an honor to have your work, so um, thank you for for showing. And I'm excited to see the ongoing uh, reaction of people walking in because everybody's blown away. I mean, oh, you, you, you so can't much. you can't help that when you walk in and see a huge pencil drawing. <laughs> <laughs> um. I do see that Gladys asked a question, and I'll just answer oh. that real quick if that's okay. Um, 
I moved to Amsterdam for the adventure and for the landscape. It is really interesting how people live with the landscape here. And it's very um, kind of large and unbridled. It's just, there's a real wildness and scale to the landscape here that I, I needed to understand in person. Um, I kind of do things the hard way. So I needed to be here <laughs> physically to um, create work based on it. So um, yeah, it's, it's, even though I'm using the Austin grass, it is, um, there's like a different kind of motion that's happening in the work just from being here. Um, that's a bit looser and I think more felt. Um, so more to come, yeah. of course. <laughs> I'm excited to see what, what comes next. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rachel, for your time. Thanks for Thank the artwork. Um, and I hope everybody can come by the gallery and see it in person. Me too. Thank you all for joining. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks. Good Bye. morning. <laughs> Bye. Bye.